بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك عند العليم الحكيم ربي زدني علما ورزقني فحما my dear brothers and sisters, my elders and my young ones, I greet you with the blessed greetings of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <coughs> MashaAllah, Jazakumullah khair for joining us again for another episode of Divine Stories, where we, alhamdulillah, <coughs> try to share the knowledge about these amazing people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Anbiya alayhi salam, <coughs> prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the most noblest of tasks. My friends, there's very, very noble things in this dunya, very, very noble things. <coughs> a mother looking after her children is such nobility. A father bringing his children and his daughters up, such nobility. A person dealing in a chivalrous way with his friends and colleagues and strangers is noble. But the most noble of things, Allahu Akbar, is the work of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. <coughs> People like you and I, who had, who were human beings, had the same desires, had the same aspirations, who sacrificed their life for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last week we mentioned about Nu alayhi salatu wasalam. And we mentioned that he spent 950 years calling them to Allah subhanahu calling his people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, what had happened is that one generation passed away, another generation came and passed away, and then a third. So he called to three generations, and how many believed in him? Very less people believed in Nur Islam, a handful. Some say less than 70, some say only his three children. Sam, Ham and Yafuth. <coughs> but the point I'm making is that the most noblest task is to call for Allah. Allahu Akbar. Who is more noble and more better than the person who calls towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this is what the prophets do and this is what we're here for today to explain to you the lives and the struggles and the aspirations <coughs> of the prophets of Allah. I mentioned last time about Nuh alayhi salam that from Nuh alayhi salam his people very very few became believers. In fact, one of the Nuh alayhi salam's uh, four children, Kinan, he also didn't be, he wasn't a believer, and he was drowned by the uh, by the the uh, the floods that Allah, Allah sent. But three other children, Sam, Ham, Yafuth, they were believers, and they with their families, their wives and everybody else who were, who, were, who were believers went and put into the ark and they were in the ark for 150 days Allah Akbar then the ark came to rest on a Mount Judi and from there they were there for another 30 days and then after 30 days on 10th of Muharram they disembarked and they then spread into the lands and Allah multiplied mankind <laughs> it is said that all mankind Every tribe, every nation, you know, can trace their roots back to one of the three children of Hazrat, Nuh alayhi salam, Sam, Ham, and Yafuth. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi, he narrates a narration on the 30th of the summer of the Allah. Imam Tirmizi also narrates a similar narration, which says that <coughs> from Sam, the Arabs flourished, that he was the ancestor of the Arabs, and from Ham, the Abyssinians. Or the dark people and then from Yafuth the Romans so everybody can all humanity can link back to one of the three children of Hazrat Nu alayhi salam but today I want to speak to you about one of the Arabian prophets and this is why you won't see anything in the Old Testament about Hazrat Hud alayhi salam because he was the Ara he was one of the Arabian prophets in fact in the hadith <coughs> narrated by uh, Abu Zarr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu in there it's mentioned 
the and uh, Ibn uh, Hazrat Ibn Hibban in Sahih mentions this hadith, and uh, he states that in a long hadith, Nabi Kareem Sallallahu said to Hazrat Abu Zar that oh, Abu Zar, the Arabian prophets, the people were, which were from the Arabian Peninsula, there were four: Hud alayhi salam, Salih alayhi salam. Shu'ib alayhi salam, and then the hadith says that Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi said to Abu Zar, O oh Abu Zar, and your Prophet, yani Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Arabian. This is why you won't find any stories in the Old Testament about Hud alayhi salam. Now, after Nuh alayhi salam, remember what I said to you initially what Shaitan does? He tricks, he beguiles. You know, only a fool will, will think that. We're in this world, and whatever we do, we do by our own selves, you know, and it's a vacuum, you just do things and nothing, nothing else influences you. The biggest influencer is Shaitan, Iblis, who said when he was cursed, what did he say to Allah? Rabbi fabima aghwaitani la qudanna lahum al mustaqim. Oh Lord, he blamed Allah, because you made me go out of this place, of this paradise. You made me leave paradise, he's blaming Allah. I will then lay in ambush for mankind. His biggest enemy is you and I, the believers who are on the path to Jannah. So he wants to ambush us and we're leaders. And then he said to Allah, Oh Allah, I will come to them from the front and the back and the left and the right. And I will ambush them, and you will not find many, many, many of them grateful to you. The biggest weapon of shaitan, my friends, we're living in the 21st century. We've been here, well, I'm 40 years old, you know your respective ages. We've not got much experience. But the truth is, how shaitan has misled mankind is via idolatry. The worship of idols. Even today, in this 21st century, yeah, the pinnacle of so-called, you know, civilization is at its pinnacle. There's people worshipping idols. Allahu Akbar. So the biggest weapon shaitan had and his biggest objective was this, to make mankind worship idols. And when people did so, shaitan would laugh at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An evil laugh. As if saying that, oh Allah, I told you so. That these people will not worship you but worship somebody else or they'll worship you and others, which is what shirk is. And we know about shirk. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi. Allah will never forgive shirk. Allah has made it clear. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalik liman yasha. Apart from this, apart from shirk, Allah will forgive what he wants for who. So shaitan knows this. So he is hell bent, no pun intended, to take people to hell, to Jahannam, because that's where he's going. Remember, Hawiya, Jahim, Saqar, Nati, Hatta, Masa, Jahannam, seven levels of Jahannam, the fourth one, who will be in the fourth Jahannam? Shaitan and his hordes. He wants the Muslims to be there as well. But we say, no thanks. So Shaitan wants to take people to Jahannam. His biggest weapon and his biggest objective is idolatry and this is how as I mentioned to you in the time of Nuh al-Islam he made people worship idols it was shaitan he comes in a human form as he probably does today as well he came in the time of Rasulullah in a human form and gave the Quraysh some devious insidious mashwari because he's very shaitan is antique shaitan is very very old and he's got knowledge you should know your enemy He's got so much knowledge. In fact, he's got knowledge of all kinds. He certainly had so much time to gain the knowledge. And he has knowledge of human beings, of their weak spots. So what he do before the time of Nul Islam is he would just plant a seed and off he'd go. And then a generation or two later, he'd reap what he sowed. People would start worshipping idols. So this is why in the deen of Allah, the hadith is clear. Al-Musawwiruna ashaddu al-adhaba yawm al-qiyama. The people who make pictures will be amongst the most severest punished on the day of judgment. You say, why? I'll tell you why. 
because in the annals of Islam and the history of mankind, because the truth is Islam wasn't just now with Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was the religion which started with Adam Alayhi Salaam. It just completed now. Because the prophets were called to the same thing, oneness of Allah, Tawheed and uh, abstention from shirk. So shaitan would do this, he'd make people worship idols. And how he'd do it is that he'd, you know, make them say, look, this idol that your parents have got, this is a source of goodness, blessings. As the time would go by, the people would start prostrating to this idol. And in doing so, commit shirk, knowingly or unknowingly. It's all the same. So now, <clears throat> what happened with the, after Nuh alayhi salam, as time progressed, people began to worship idols. And whose fault was that? Shaitan, Iblis, again. So as I said to you, the reason why people who make uh, tasawirs or pictures of animal objects, because there's no harm in non-animal objects, is because this was the biggest reason for people becoming disbelievers. And disbelieving doesn't just mean that a disbeliever, you know, uh, is a small thing. It means his eternity will be spent in the fire of Jahannam. This is what believers believe. If you're a believer, you'll understand eternity. This life is a small little drop in the ocean compared to eternity. So shirk is very, very dangerous. This is why Islam stops all avenues to shirk. So these small innocent pictures that you see <coughs> are not so innocent in the passage of time because you don't know you and I if we're gone from the dunya and these pictures we have of yourself and myself and other people venerated uh, people who are venerated a time will come when under no guidance people will start worshipping these people because shaitan is always there to influence and he's going to make sure he makes people's minds inclined towards shirk worshipping these idols and that's what he did in the past that's what he'll do again so Islam says no idols no you can't put a picture in your house if you do angels of mercy don't enter the house when you go to a masjid when you go to a place of worship <coughs> excuse me you see the feeling of tranquility the feeling of peace when you go to, Billah, to a place of evil a nightclub a place where other evil is committed, you will feel the vibe and you'll feel the atmosphere and you feel the coldness and you feel shaitan's presence. In the house of Allah, wherever they may be, you feel the blessings of the angels and they make you calm and they make you cool and they affect you uh, with tranquility. <coughs> so, idol worship, the cause to idol worship has been in the past pictures and statues. This is why Islam has forbidden it. But in the time of Nur Islam, after they came onto land and they multiplied, Shaitan again came and he sowed his seed. And after a while, <coughs> the first people <coughs> who worshipped idols was somebody known as the nation of Hud alayhi salam, Qawmi Ad. And that's who we're going to speak about today. The nation of Ad. Allahu Akbar. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi'aad ira madhati al-ibad allati lam yukhlaq misluha fil bilad. These people, they were giants. After a while after Nuh and people were in the dunya, certain people began to be born. And then these people were big people. And as the next generation became bigger, bigger, bigger until the people of Ad came. The people of Ad were like giants. The Quran says, these people had so much power. They were human beings like you and I from the uh, three sons of uh, Nuh al-Islam, like you and I. But Allah had an intention. That these people would be created in such proportions and such with such strength that never before and never again will they be created. In mountains, Quran Sharif tells us, in mountains, they would, uh, you know, with their hands, they would make houses for themselves. In the Petra Valley, like a friend of mine <coughs> says to me, in the Petra Valley, I've not been to the Petra Valley, but apparently in the Petra Valley, in Jordan, I think, you can see these huge, humongous caves. Allahu Akbar. And this is where the people of Ard lived. 
the people of Ad, where did they live? So as I mentioned to you, their prophet was Hud, and he was a Arab, the first of the Arabian prophets. So between San'a, Yemen, and <clears throat> Oman, between these near an area called Hadramaut, this is where the people of, uh, of Hud, السلام, this is where they lived. Now these people were the last word in strength and vigor and in manliness and in every other, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, completeness, they were very powerful. And Allah Ta'ala blessed them with wealth and health and lands and, you know, physical power. And they would say, Man ashaddu minna quwa. Who is more powerful than us? And that was the truth. There was nobody more powerful than them. But when they disobeyed Allah, when they disobeyed their own brother, i.e. brother from the same clan or brother from the same area, Hazrat Hud when they when they were destroyed, <clears throat> and I'll mention this in detail, the winds came. The winds came after many chances. The winds came and they said, when they saw the winds, that, you know, mashallah, the clouds coming, we're going to have rain because they were suffering from three years of drought, no water, famine. But when the winds came, they took these people up all the way to the sky and the animals and flung them back. You could hear the screams of these people as they were lifted up and then they were flung back until they were like hollow palm of date trees. Nothing left to them. But this didn't happen all of a sudden. The Quran Sharif tells us about these people. The people, Iram Adatil Imad. Iram means two meanings. One is the place where they live, and second is that they were like Iram Adatil Imad, like big pillars. They were so huge, they were like pillars. And I always say, if you want to understand this and give you itself a bit of a scientific proof is that look around you the animals around us will always be proportionate to our size relatively so the horses will be maybe slightly higher than us <coughs> donkeys slightly lower than us etc but not you know like four or five times unless it's a giraffe's neck or something or a, you know so the time of ad where did the, you know this was the time of the dinosaurs the time the time of these huge animals we hear about so the men of the time would have been proportional. So they were huge giants. Now the Quran Sharif says to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to them a prophet. The first of the Arabian prophets, Hud alayhi salam. وَإِلَىٰ آدٍ أَخَامْ هُودًا And to Aad was their brother Hud alayhi salam. قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اِبُدُ اللَّهِ O people, worship Allah. مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ غَيْرُ Don't be under any illusion or delusion. There's none worthy of worship but Allah. Afala in antum illa muftarun. Therefore, everything else you say about these idols, there are three idols, Sada, Samada, and Hara. Three idols, Sada, Samara, and Hara. They would worship these. So, who the Islam is saying to them, in antum illa muftarun, you're just lying. Muftarun, you're making things up that these are your lords. You've got sound faculty. Use your intellect. How can they be your lords? And he reminded them, Ya qawmi la As I said to you at the beginning, the prophets were the most noble of people. They did it for Allah. They sacrificed the life for Allah. And they took so much pain for Allah. Ya qawmi la As Oh my people, I'm not asking you for any monetary benefit that you can benefit me, fill my bank account, so to speak, with money. No. In ajriya illa ala fatarni. My recompense. My jaza, my recompense, and my reward is with the Creator who created me. And this is what we believe as well. The goodness we do, we don't want anyone to reciprocate with any, you know, physical thing. Why? Because it's not for you. If we do goodness for a person, then fair enough, you expect it. But we do it for Allah on the day when there'll be nothing worthwhile but the good you've done. So any good we do, as the prophets do, is for Allah's pleasure. It's good to remind yourself that when we do good to somebody, don't expect anything bad from them, uh, anything uh, <clears throat> good from them. You're doing it for Allah. Allah will reward you. As I the Hud said, Afala ta'kilun. He said to them, Do you have no aql? Do you have no intelligence? And the truth was, they had no intelligence. As if they had no intelligence. They were so 
clever in every other way, but when it came to Allah, they chose to become like fools. And they said to Hudra Islam that you are a fool, as we'll, as you'll see. And then Hudra Islam said to him, وَيَا قَوْمِ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ O oh my people, do istighfar, ask Allah for forgiveness. O oh Allah, we've sinned, we're human beings, we're, you know, we're designed to do sins. We have these uh, passions and these inclinations. And that's how Allah has designed us. So therefore do istighfar and then draw near to Allah. So matubu ilay, what will you get? Yursil is sama alaykum midrara. Allah will send the rains upon you in abundance. They were suffering, in Dori Mansur it's mentioned, they were suffering from famine and drought for three years, like the people <coughs> of Nuh alayhi salam. And Hud alayhi salam said the same thing to them. He mentioned his things in three things. First of all, he said to them, don't worship other than Allah. Number two, I don't want any monetary uh, uh, recompense from you. So do, why do you think I'm doing it for? Use your you know, brains. <coughs> and thirdly, he showed them a way out. Do istighfar. Ask forgiveness from Allah for worshipping these three idols, Sada, Samada and Hara. And then draw near to Allah. How do we draw near to Allah? By doing things that please Allah. Whatever you do, goodness. Nowadays, goodness is becoming obsolete. Goodness is becoming obsolete. People don't believe in goodness. Doing people, doing good things to other, uh, uh, doing good things to other people. It's like a, what do they call it? A post-modern society. A post-truth society, if you want. For Muslims, the default mode is to do good, to continue to do good, to do good until you lie in your grave. And then you will see in your grave them very good things you did, like you, like you know, they'll be personified. And then you'll draw a cool breath and you'll look and you'll see your Jannah. And you'll be lying on a bed of Jannah and you'll be made to wear the clothes of Jannah. And that's in the grave. Never mind the hair, ne never mind the uh, day of judgment and then the uh, paradise. So he said to the people, who the Islam, that <coughs> do istighfar and then draw close to Allah by doing good actions. And what will you get? In the hereafter, you'll get your paradise. But in the dunya, you'll get these things. Your sister, Malik Midrara, Allah will send the rains in abundance for you. And continues, <coughs> This strength that you are so, you know, happy and arrogant about, Allah will double the strength. And increase your strength in physical way and in your health. But you know, heed what I'm saying to you. Don't turn away like criminals, like mujrimin. I'm saying this for your benefit. I'm not getting any money from you. I'm not a madman. What did they say to Hazrat Hud after listening to this? They said, Qalu ya hudu ma jitana bi bayina. Oh Hud. You bought no proof for us. Every prophet has a proof, a miracle. And Hud al-Islam had the same. So they said this just in rebellious and in mischievousness. <coughs> they said, you've bought no uh, miracles. وَمَا نَحْنُ بِتَارِكِ آلِهَتِنَا عَنْ قَوْلِكَ So therefore, we're not going to leave our three ideas just because of what you said and abandon the way of our ancestors. وَمَا نَحْنُ لَكَ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ Let's spell it out for you, O Hud. We're not going to become believers in you. We're happy to indulge in our things. It's our money, it's our land, it's our life. Let me and let us live it. One life, live it. Astaghfirullah. One life, live it. Of course, live it like a servant of Allah. And then when you go in the hereafter, Allah will make you a king. A very good deal. Subhanallah. But they said, uh -uh, we're not going to believe in you. And what did they say? Inna qulu illa taraka ba'du aliyahdina bisu. You know what, Hud? We think that you've been saying all these things, bad things about our idols. It looks like they've done something bad to you and they've affected your mental equilibrium. A polite way of saying that you're not mentally well. Astaghfirullah. How absurd. It looks like some of our, you know, these uh, three idols that they worship, it looks like some of these have uh, affected you and you're not well. Hud al-Islam listened to this and he said, Qala inni ushidu Allah. 
Let me also make it clear to you people that I am completely, <coughs> I've got nothing to do with your idols. Let me spell it out in front of Allah. I take Allah as my witness and I spell it out to you as well. I've got nothing to do with your idolatry. And then he said to them, this challenge, مِن دُونِهِ فَقِيدُونِي ثُمَّ لَا تُنْذِرُونَ as I stand here, who the said to the people, you and your idols, you try to harm me. Open challenge to a nation of warriors. The people of Ad, the Qomi Ad, people of Hud Islam were warriors. Warriors, strong men, people with pride. And here is Hud Islam openly, you know, uh, as in Urdu you say, Lalkarrayunko. He is openly saying to them, challenging them and putting their pride in dust that here I am, do your best and bring your idol to do what they can do. And you know what? They couldn't do anything. This was a reply in two aspects. First of all, when they said that our idols have bewitched you, if they could bewitch him, then they certainly could harm him. They didn't harm him, therefore they didn't bewitch him. Number one. And number two, they said you've not bought us any proof. This was another proof that in spite of me being one man, and you being an army, you haven't got the ability to harm me. And this is what transpired. They didn't harm Hud al-Islam. Inshallah, in the next period, in the next episode, I'll continue with the story of Hud alayhi salam and the people of Ad who were given everything but فَكَفَرُوا بِعَنُمِ اللَّهِ But they disbelieved in Allah and Allah then made them taste the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, in the next episode, please join me again to listen to these stories. <coughs> and by stories, I mean factual stories because it's in the Quran. Tilka min anba'il ghayb nuhiha ilayk ma kunta ta'lamuha anta wala qawmuk min kabli hadha. Fasbir inna al-aqib al-muttaqeen. That these stories, Allah has revealed in revelation and nobody else knew these without revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, inshallah, in the next session, we'll continue from here and also mention the people of Samud, who were the inheritors of the people of uh, Hud alayhi salam. Jazakumullah khair for listening, inshallah, and look forward to the next episode. Jazakumullah khair, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdika, ishadu wa allah, ilan ta astaghfirullah wa tubu alayhi wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, il aliyyil azim, jazakumullah.